It's also suggested that um, in prevention that one focus on the cancers that can be prevented through immunization, uh, such as the HPV vac vaccination and the vaccine for hepatitis B. They also suggest that a number of cancers can be treated in cost-effective ways, provided they can be diagnosed at their earlier stages, as noted here as well. Now, however, when you're thinking about low resource settings, it's quite clear that many of them do not have the capacity or much capacity to treat. And therefore, as countries move toward uh, wanting to treat more cancers, it's going to be important for a number of them, especially the low resource countries, to develop radiation facilities, to develop better lab and pathology facilities for cancer, to promote surgical treatment for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancers, as well as to enhance their ability to provide palliative care. Let's move on now and talk about diabetes. There are two kinds of diabetes. There's type 1 and type 2. Type 1 is an autoimmune disorder that attacks and destroys the cells in the pancreas that produce insulin and usually begins at relatively earlier ages. Type 2 is a condition when people do not make enough insulin or their bodies do not efficiently use the insulin they make. This is the most common form of diabetes globally and it usually occurs at uh, later ages. Diabetes was the ninth leading cause of death in 2010. It was the eighth leading cause of death in high income countries and it was the tenth leading cause of death in low and middle income countries. It was also the eighth leading cause of DALIs globally in uh, 2010, but the 16th leading cause of DALIs in low and middle income countries. So let's look at a graphic that examines the prevalence rate. What share of the adult population in these different regions, and these are regions as defined by the International Diabetes Federation, what share of the adult, uh, adults in these regions in 2014 actually had diabetes. And what we see is that it ranges from about 5 to around 11. And remember, at 11 percent, you're talking about one of every nine adults is walking around with diabetes. Uh, it's relatively lower in uh, Africa, but we know it's, uh, it's growing, and it rises with probably the highest rates here in North America and the Caribbean for these regions, though there are pockets in the Western Pacific where an extraordinarily large share of the adult population actually has diabetes. And as we look at this, I want to highlight the fact that uh, these rates are growing. In fact, many people are referring to a global epidemic of diabetes. And in fact, we can look at the projections that the International Diabetes Federation has made of what they think will happen to the number of individuals in different parts of the world who will be affected by diabetes as we look forward to 2035. And what you can see is around a doubling or close to a doubling in many of these regions and globally of the number of people who are expected or anticipated, certainly in the absence of major changes in lifestyles, to have diabetes in 2035. And not a surprise when you look at these numbers, therefore, that some people refer to this as an epidemic that's truly frightening, given the, the potential impact of diabetes on so many levels. Now, the risk factors for type 1 diabetes are still being studied. However, type 1 diabetes is associated with a family history of diabetes. And in addition, environmental factors, uh, increased weight and height development, increased maternal age at birth, and exposure to some viral infections have also been linked to developing type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is also associated with a family history of diabetes. In addition, however, as almost everyone now knows, it's associated with diet, 
and physical inactivity, obesity, insulin resistance, ethnicity, and increasing age. In high-income countries, less educated and lower-income individuals have higher rates of diabetes than better educated and wealthier individuals do. The cost and consequences of diabetes can be very high at the individual, household, and societal level. First, diabetes has a number of important and costly health implications. Among the most common are eye problems that can cause blindness, kidney problems, circulatory problems that can uh, result in amputation of the lower extremities, stroke, and coronary heart disease. An especially important fact about diabetes is that about two-thirds of the people with diabetes have some form of disability compared to about one-third of the po population that does not have diabetes. It's estimated, in fact, that the direct costs of treating diabetes vary between around 2 or 3 percent and 15 percent of health expenditures in different countries, depending both on their pattern of expenditure and on the prevalence of diabetes in those settings. The indirect costs of diabetes in low- and middle-income countries are also substantial, partly reflecting the fact that many people in these countries live with diabetes without proper treatment and therefore they suffer from substantial uh, disability and important losses in productivity. Now, unfortunately, given the way the world is moving and given these estimates that we've seen, we probably have to anticipate much larger costs and consequences of diabetes in the future than we see today. And sometimes these will be truly enormous. A study that was done in the, Western, in, um, in the Pacific Islands estimated that the cost of treating one diabetic for one person year was almost 40,000 US dollars. Studies done in the English-speaking Caribbean also showed the enormous cost and consequences, including substantial uh, shares of the adult population that actually suffered uh, diabetes related amputations of their lower extremities. Now let's talk uh, before we end about how diabetes might be uh, prevented and addressed. There's no evidence that type 1 diabetes can be prevented. However, avoiding being overweight is the single most important way to prevent type 2 diabetes. Although large-scale efforts to, to reduce ob obesity have generally not been very successful, and this is an area where the world and in individual countries clearly have to do better, a pilot project that used intensive counseling at the personal level to promote weight loss actually showed substantial and successful results in China, Finland, Sweden, and the United States, though only on a relatively small and pilot basis. Uh, in this case, the average weight loss of the individuals involved after three years was about 10 pounds more than in a control group that did not participate. In addition, the study group had a 58 percent lower rate of type 2 diabetes than the control group. This is good, but I repeat that there are very few, there's very little evidence so far of large-scale efforts uh, that have shown an ability to help a large number of people uh, reduce their weight and avoid or deal with obesity. So in this light, let's summarize in the next graphic what is recommended for addressing diabetes. First, it's essential to avoid being overweight. Second, it's important to promote healthier eating. Physical activity, of course, is also very important. People with diabetes often need to be treated with insulin. It's important that diabetics, uh, that hypertension in diabetics also be controlled. And because of the uh, problems with the lower extremities, it's also very important that people with diabetes be provided appropriate foot care. Countries with appropriate resources should also vaccinate against flu and pneumococcal infections, treat retinal problems, and treat hypertension with ACE inhibitors 
to prevent kidney problems from worsening. And this set of activities is also very important for dealing with reducing the complications from diabetes and the large costs and consequences that can come from them. Cancer and diabetes take an enormous toll. In addition, they often strike earlier and with higher death rates in low and middle income countries than in high income countries. Moreover, as populations age, more people in low and middle income countries smoke and diets change, there's a risk that the number of people with these diseases will continue to grow in today's low and middle income countries, even as the rates of cancer deaths in high income countries actually declines. Yet, as we discussed, there's a range of cost-effective and doable investments that could prevent some of this disease and treat some of it as it arises. Clearly, low- and middle-income countries need to take steps now to cope more effectively with cancer and diabetes. In the next session, we'll talk about tobacco and alcohol.